This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here. Go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And we are bringing back, shoot, we're going to have to give this guy a co-host title at some point. He's been on enough times. Mr. Kevin Ring from the Institute of Work Comp Professionals is here. And man, he... Listen, if you're not part of the Institute, are you really even selling workers comp at this point? I got to be honest with you. I'm one of these people who feels like I know my way around a little bit, certainly have made a, a decent you know, chunk of change leading with workers comp, understand the sales process. And there is not a day that goes by that I don't get an email with a piece of information or I see something out on social that I pick up and can add to my arsenal just because I made the decision to join the Institute of Work Comp Professionals, but it's not just me. I made the decision for the entire agency because it's a great way for you as an agency principal to get your producers out there and knocking on doors as quickly as possible by getting them that certified work comp advisor designation. It's not like it's this absolutely horrendous process where you have to go through 15 weeks of schooling and then donate your right kidney before you get the designation. You go through a practical amount of coursework. You're tested to make sure you understand it with the culmination being a final test to determine whether or not you're awarded that designation. And if you are, if you get through all of that stuff, you can go out and you can have a conversation with any prospect that you run into at an educated level on workers comp, the experience mod, and all of this stuff that goes with it. So I don't normally open the podcast with a commercial, and I hope you didn't take it that this is a commercial. This is an actual review of my agency, and it's something that is now ingrained in our culture. And every single person who joins, the very first thing we do is we get them that CWCA so they can speak the language that the rest of us speak. Now that we got all of that out of the way, Part of the reason Kevin's on here is because there have been a bunch of updates that have been handed down from NCCI, and we wanted to talk about some of that stuff. So, Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you go to town. Where do you want to start? Well, uh, thanks so much, David. It's great to be here, and I certainly appreciate the the kind words, and we've uh, we've enjoyed working with your team. Um, what NCCI is doing is updating the experience rating plan uh, starting uh, largely in 2024. And we can talk about some of those specifics if you like. There are a few states uh, that are getting this late in 2023. Uh, just NCCI a few years ago changed it where the states with you know November uh, rate filings uh, get the, the new rules uh, early instead of almost a year later, which is had been the pattern uh, in the past. But there's uh, there's two big things changing and, and two things that agents are going to notice when they look at their clients' experience mods worksheets after, after this change takes effect uh, in their states. And that's that uh, each state is getting its own separate split point where uh, Forever, uh, at least as far as any of us are concerned, uh, the split point has been the same, and we can certainly dive into to what the split point is. Uh, and then the other big change is that the uh, the claim cap uh, is changing in every state, and in most cases, really, really substantially. So that's the number uh, where if a, an injury exceeds that amount, 
uh, it it stops impacting the experience mod. So for instance, if a state had a cap of $500,000 and you had a million dollar claim, uh, that, that claim only impacts the mod up to 500,000 and the other half a million uh, just gets thrown out. Uh, and you know, those are the, those are the big changes that are happening. Yeah. And I think that's interesting, man, because a lot of people right now don't realize with the cap being on some of those larger claims, it saves their clients bacon. I mean, I, I, you could make the argument and it's probably even true that frequency hammers the mod in a much greater way than severity does. If you don't have programs and procedures in place, how much is removing the cap or adjusting that cap going to level the playing field between frequency and severity on the mod calculation? Do you think? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, there is that, that old cliche that frequency is worse than severity, uh, which is, is true as long as as we define frequency in terms of dollars, uh, right? So sometimes we'll get the question, you know, I've got this client, they like to, uh, you know, they like to have a bunch of small stuff, nicks and cuts and little, you know, one or two stitches here or there, and they've had a boatload of those, is that gonna blow up their experience mod? Well, only insofar as, you know, there's a meaningful number of dollars attached to those, they're all, you know, 250, 500 bucks, uh, then it's not going to have a, a big impact. Um, the, the big difference with the change in the claim cap, and I'm just looking at a spreadsheet uh, that I put together for our folks, which uh, references these numbers. And in, for the states that already have the rate filing published for, um, for these changes, and that's, I don't know, 10 or 12 states now, um, have done that. You know, you look at Illinois, which is always one of the states with the worst rep reputations for workers' comp, uh, and they have one of the highest claim caps. And it was uh, for 2023 that number was 458,500. Uh, for uh, 2024, it's 206,000. So well over a 50% decrease uh, in that number. Uh, glancing through some of the others here, um, many of them. Are, are more than 50% down. And I think what you'll see is not so much a balancing of frequency and severity, but more that when, uh, when a business unfortunately does have something that's very severe for whatever reason, uh, the impact of that isn't going to be as great uh, as it has been in the past. Um, it's certainly still going to have a substantial impact and the impact is going to depend on you know, what else is on the mod, uh, including payroll and the class codes and that. Uh, but but the impact of those, you know, quote unquote, shock losses uh, isn't going to be as great as it's been in the past. Yeah, it's interesting because I would have thought they were raising it. <laughs> so they're actually bringing it down and capping it at a lower amount, which in theory should help people who maybe had, and, and I guess, let me ask this question. How is this going to, is this only moving forward or once they adopt this, is it going to attach to those historical periods on the mod, even the, the mod coming out in 24, will it contemplate a look back period or is this just moving forward? Well, so let's, yeah, let's talk about that um, and zoom out just a little bit and talk about, how these values work on the mod period. Uh, so the, the values that are used on an experience mod, so that's the expected loss rates and D ratios that are attached to the class codes. That's the, the split point that is contemplated when it calculates the claims on the mod, uh, as well as uh, the cap. Those values are determined by the effective date of the experience mod. Uh, so if we look at a state like uh, Iowa, Iowa's, uh, they've, they've published their rate filing and it's effective January 1st of 2024. When you look at a January 1st of 2024 experience mod in the state of Iowa, uh, we would expect a 1-1 one, one of 24 mod to have not the 23 policy, but 22, 21, and 20. Uh, there's certainly a possibility you could have different periods if 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 the facts were that way but typically if a business has kept the same effective date 
You're going to have not the most recent and the three prior policies. But the values that are on that mod are going to be the values for the state of Iowa effective 1-1 one, one of 24. The fact that there's a 2020 policy on there doesn't mean that that policy has the 2020 rating values applied to it. Uh, so uh, in Iowa, the split point is going from 18,500 to 29,500. That's going to impact all the information on a 1-1 one, one of 24 mod in Iowa. Uh, the cap in Iowa is going down from 327,500 to 181,500, and that's going to impact all the claims on the mod for 1-1 one, one of 24, regardless of what the policy effective date uh, was uh, for that policy on the mod. That is a substantial increase to the split point, at least relative to what I'm used to seeing here in Florida. To take the yeah, split point been, that it's high, been it's going to be 1,500 now for a couple of years. So, in your experience, have you seen it go up that much in in a single kick? Like, what was it before? It was eight? It felt like it was only creeping up by like a thousand or five hundred every year for a few years there, and then it stalled out at eighteen five. Yeah, it's been at eighteen five for a couple of years now, and it's been increasing uh, since twenty thirteen when it went from five thousand. Uh, and NCCI realized probably in twenty ten or twenty eleven because these things take time to. Uh, to run through that a $5,000 split point was no longer uh, sufficient. And what they're doing with this new split point update is they are looking at the claim history of each individual state um, rather than looking at all the information and trying to find a split point that works for, for everybody. Uh, and so like in Iowa, it's at 29.5, but Oregon's going to be 9,500 um, because Oregon has way less expensive claims. Now, people sometimes freak out when the split point goes up, but it's in, important to know that it's not going up in a vacuum. Um, what's also changing, and I'm, I'm working on a, a project as these rate filings get published, um, to, to look at exactly how this is changing. But when, when expected losses are calculated on the mod, there's two pieces uh, to how the expected losses work. There's the expected loss rate for each class code, which you know, big picture is the amount of money per $100 of payroll uh, that, uh, that NCCI expects someone in that class code to have in claims. So if the expected loss rate is a dollar, uh, then you're going to get $1 of expected losses for every $100 of payroll uh, in that class code. Then you have uh, the D ratio, which is the percentage of expected losses that are expected to be primary. And the split point for each state, what NCCI has said about that is that it is, um, it is being set at roughly 40% of the average cost per claim in that state. Uh, so I can't do the math fast enough, but for someone listening to this, you can probably think about 29,500 and realize that it's 40% of some larger number, probably in the neighborhood of what, like uh, 75,000 or something like that. And the D ratios on average, not universally, not across the board, but the D ratios on average are also going to be uh, 40%. And uh, so when the split point increases, the expected primary loss is also increasing uh, to offset that. And, and that probably introduces an opportunity to talk about why uh, NCCI is making this change. And, and ultimately, the answer to that question is, the same as the answer to why California changed their experience rating plan, I don't know, five, six years ago now, why New York changed theirs in October of uh, 22, why Pennsylvania is changing theirs uh, in April of 24. And it's to make the experience mod function more effectively, to make it more accurate. 
Uh, and so what NCCI found is that by, I mean, if for an example or a piece of this, by setting the split point per state, what you wind up with is a more accurate prediction of the future, which ultimately is the whole reason the experience mod exists, which is to look at a business's history of claims uh, and to determine whether they are above average, whether they perform better uh, than the average business like theirs, or they're below average and they have a worse claim history uh, so that insurance companies can adjust their pricing accordingly. I think that it's interesting that we have some states that do their own thing and some states that fall under NCCI. And it seems like there's so much difference between one state and the next, even with these changes, just a couple that you've talked about coming up. Do you think we run a risk of NCCI just not being relevant and these states end up bringing this stuff in at some point to handle themselves? Wow. Um, I don't think that's what would happen if we decided that NCCI was irrelevant. Um, so I've had some conversations with, with some pretty high level and even top level people at a couple of different independent state rating bureaus and have had conversations with them about, well, why do you do it this way instead of the way that NCCI does it? And their answer is because we think this solution suits us better. But what's interesting, and this has been true in, in every state that I mentioned previously, is that uh, none of them, at least in the last 20 years, uh, none of them have really completely revolutionized their experience rating calculation. The one that's come closest um, is probably California, but even in California, if you look at an experience mod from 15 years ago, uh, the numbers are, are pretty much the same, even though their method has changed. Pennsylvania is the same way. Uh, they're going to a system that, that looks a lot like California, uh, but, but if you look at the numbers and the, the values they use to calculate the mod in Pennsylvania, they're largely uh, the same. And so um, experience rating in general, and this is not an NCCI statement, this is rating bureaus across the country. Uh, experience rating in general is, I would say its importance is in decline. Um, it's required, uh, the states require the experience mod to be on the policy. Uh, but David, you can tell me your experience. I've talked to other agents about this. Uh, and I've even talked to some insurance company people. And, and what I continue to hear is that insurance companies, uh, even not especially large insurance companies, are using their internal models. So they'll take your submission. They look at the losses that companies had. And they say, we think we need X premium to write this account. Uh, and different states have different ways to, to modify the premium through, and I know rates are fixed in Florida, but in a lot of other states, um, you know, an insurance company might have five different insurance companies and they'll, they'll talk about them as rate tiers. Um, and, and they have credits and debits that are available to them. And they'll say, can we use all of these tools at our disposal to get to the number that we want, including the experience bond. Uh, if we can get to that number, uh, then cool. Um, if we can't get to that number, then we just we just won't quote it. Um, and I really think that if you could get deep, deep in the head of some of the people making the decisions at all these different rating bureaus, that one of the things that they're fighting against is, is becoming extinct, is experience rating just getting wiped out. And um, I certainly know some people that would be thrilled if that happened. Um, I have two concerns if it ever did happen. The first is, uh, is that NCCI specifically, and then if you wanna pair them with uh, California and New York, because they're independent bureaus that service massive populations, um, they serve an incredibly important purpose in terms of data collection. Uh, these rating bureaus coordinate and every medical bill 
And every indemnity check that goes out to one of your insured's injured employees goes into uh, this system that they've built. And it's all anonymized. Like you can't search for Kevin Ring's workers' comp claim in this system, uh, but they can see what's the diagnosis code, what's the treatment. And this allows them to get really deep into things that are impacting the system uh, at a level that an individual insurance company, even the very largest ones we all know, could never see because, because the rating bureaus are seeing everything. Uh, and so if the experience mod went away, uh, then, then there's a, a loss of incentive for you know insurance companies to pony up what I'm sure is the big, big bucks that they're paying to these rating bureaus uh, to be members. And, uh, and it would hurt the, the industry in general. Now, going back to your question, the, the danger that states would face if they decided they wanted to back out of NCCI, um, and I'll look at a state like North Carolina. Uh, so North Carolina has its own independent bureau. Uh, they have a mod worksheet that looks different than NCCI's, but while they have some internal actuarial folks, they aren't doing the heavy lifting. They're actually outsourcing a lot of that data processing and all of their uh, rate making when it comes to assigned risk values and, um, and experience rating values. All of that is done by NCCI. And the, the amount of very expensive labor that states would have to um, acquire in order to do what California and Pennsylvania and New York have done uh, would be would be really challenging. Um, I think that what NCCI is moving towards is answering the question uh, that some of these independent bureaus have already answered, which is, you know, this way, this other way of solving the experience rating problem um, is better for our state. And I think this is a first step in NCCI creating a more bespoke solution for each state, rather than trying to just put the same values on, uh, on everyone. Um, I don't expect another change to come from NCCI anytime soon. Um, you know, like I, I mentioned before, the last change was in 2003. I think the last change before that was in the mid nineties. So, I mean, not 2003, 2013, you know, so I would expect it to be another eight, 10 years, um, but I could be totally wrong on that. I wouldn't be surprised if we were having this conversation in 10 years and NCCI has, has made another shift potentially uh, closer to what New York and California and Pennsylvania uh, have done and are doing and what Delaware has been doing for, uh, for 20 years. So um, the, uh, the change never stops. So two comments um, going back on a couple of things that you had said. Number one, yeah, uh, Florida has fixed pricing. And what we've seen, to your point, is a lot of people using their internal underwriting models and algorithms to determine what the loss pick is and ultimately how much premium they need to collect to remain profitable. And it's not affecting the bad performing accounts nearly as much as it affects the, the good performing accounts. We see construction companies and manufacturers that have sizable premium and experience mods that may be in the 0.55 to 0.65 range. And when they run it through the modeling, they actually end up wanting to put a consent to rate on the quote because they can't get to the number based on how low the mod makes the premium, which is just crazy. Try selling that to somebody. You know, here they are with, a great mod and you have to explain it. And I mean, I can tell you for those of you that are agents in Florida, the only way that I figured out how to get around it, especially if it's something that I see happening at more than one carrier and it's becoming a trend is I will always at least have that underwriter give me a dividend option that more than gets us back the consent to rate. If we're in that zero to 5% range. So 
at least if you're going to be in that position, go back to underwriting, get them to commit to give you a mechanism to earn some of that back. And even then it's not instantaneous. Yes, you can get some of these that have front end dividends on them that are guaranteed, but that kind of defeats the purpose. The, the underwriter wants the flexibility of that sliding scale on the back end. The other thing that I've seen, and I'm interested in your thoughts here, and I'm sure you're aware of some of these, but there are a couple of different insure techs out there that feel that they have an algorithm that is more dialed in to predict future losses than what the experience mod is. And some of these are even tied to paper. So they don't even have to use the mod if they don't want to, I assume. I mean, I don't know. Are there legal ramifications around that, that if you're a carrier and it's an NCCI state, are you legally required to use the mod or can you just throw it out the window and use your own proprietary algorithm if it's more accurate? That's a, a state law question, but my impression has been that that every state requires the use of the experience mod. Now, how they use it is, they it has to be in the premium calculation. Right, so there's if you you can look in the NCCI basic manual, um, and the states that are NCCI states and the other states have this as well. But we're talking about NCCI, um, and the NCCI manuals you know govern everything about how the workers' comp policy works, and those are adopted uh, by each individual state. And so, in the premium algorithm is uh, the experience mod, but all they have to do is, is make the math work with the experience mod to get the number they want, right? So if they want $100,000 uh, and and that company would pay $100,000 in, in manual premium and they have, so they, they'd have $125,000 premium if all they were using was the mod. Uh, well, in a state like North Carolina where you can give a 25% credit, then they'll just use that that lever they have to get the premium down down to a hundred. Um, some of what you're talking about specifically in Florida, and I actually read something about this last week. Uh, part of the challenge is becoming that the rates have gotten so low in many places. And the article that I read was like a, a Florida Contractors Association actually asking for workers' comp rates to not go down, uh, which blew my mind. Um, it, it, I was like, what is this employers asking for, for higher workers comp rates? And, and they weren't concerned about the, uh, the mod, they were concerned about, you know, premium adequacy, um, and feeling that, that somehow, uh, the rates that are coming out don't actually represent the, the facts on the ground. Um, I have heard about some of these insure techs that are trying to solve, effectively the experience rating problem in uh, in a different way. And I can't argue that we don't need that. You know, experience rating as a concept uh, is probably as old as actuarial science. And uh, to, to talk briefly about the level of nerd I am about this, I've actually read papers on experience rating from like the 1910s from the American Casualty Actuarial Society. Um, and I don't know, in the last couple of months, I actually read something that was tangentially about the birth of NCCI. Um, it was initially just, just a collection of actuaries that, that the states hired to, to work on some stuff in New York. And eventually uh, it became its own, uh, its own company. But um, the issue with experience rating is is the lag, right? So there's this idea that that we don't use generally, we never use the most recent policy period. Uh, and the idea is to let these claims uh, mature a little bit. But what insurance companies are doing now is that if you bring them a company like the one you were describing with a mod in the 50s or 60s, if the most recent policy period was a dumpster fire, well, they aren't going to look at that 60 mod and say, oh, well, yeah, they obviously deserve a 40% credit, even though they had a 200% loss ratio last year. Um, 
And so they're looking at that more recent data and considering it credible where the experience rating calculation everywhere, this is universal, not across, not just for NCCI, where the experience rating calculation says um, that we don't consider that information uh, and they, they can't consider it because they don't have it. But I think even if we change the rules so they did have some of that information, they would still say this doesn't, this isn't old enough. This hasn't had enough chance to mature uh, for us to feel that it's credible uh, in, in, in modeling an experience mod. And I don't know the details of what some of these startups are doing, but I feel like at the heart of it is they are looking to find answers, not just from that older information, but from newer information. Uh, and, and I think that there's, there's space for that approach. Uh, the question that everyone's gonna have to answer is, you know, where does that fit in? Uh, what are they gonna, what are the regulators gonna do? Um, what impact does that have on, on rating bureaus? And those are things that I, I haven't seen. Um, I will say that there's a, a huge space for that kind of thing on the high end of the workers' comp market, when you start talking about uh, deductibles, I could see that being used in the captive space where the experience mod is already largely irrelevant. And, um, and it's been down to actuaries and people doing loss picks and things like that. And it sounds, what I've heard about those kind of companies is that there's an immediate application for what they're doing in that space. And then it remains to be seen if they can find a way to work it down market. Here's what I'm hearing, man. There's a whole bunch of reasons why people need to be involved with the Institute because there's no way any normal agency can keep up with this stuff, man. I mean, I feel like I'm above average in that I get the nightly email from NCCI with whatever happened that day. But I'll be honest with you. I'm only looking to see what mods changed that I've been tracking. I'm not... I never pay attention to all of the stuff on the top half of that email. And that's you live in the top half of that email. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's your world, man. So, I mean, it's, it makes it, um, it makes it easy for me to do what I do knowing I don't have to go through and spend the time to read all that stuff in real time and know it, that when I run into a question, I know, I know who my resource is to ask, but I mean, I think that this is going to be a huge differentiator at the point of sale in 2024. If there's this many changes in, in quite a few States, people better be paying attention to what those changes are, how it affects their prospects, how it affects their clients. Cause this is a prime opportunity for people to come pick your pocket on your own book of business when you least expect it. And it's interesting in Florida right now, these monoline comp carriers are begging for business. They, I, I didn't realize the comp market was as soft as it is, but they're telling me that it's the softest it's ever been since any of them have been in workers comp in Florida. And I mean, carrier after carriers coming in saying, what else you got? What else you got? What else you got? And it's like, wow, I, I'm not used to this. Usually it's no, no, no. <laughs> you know, now it's like you can actually have a conversation again, which is interesting because, you know, the narrative between five and 10 years ago when predictive modeling first started showing up was, Oh, I'm sorry. Reject. There's nothing we can do about it. We, we can't have a conversation anymore. Like they, they were so sold out to the new technology that they completely abandoned the whole underwriting conversation that we'd been having for decades. Right. And now it seems like the market's gotten so soft that now they want to have those underwriting conversations again, which begs the question, what happened to your predictive modeling? Like, did it not work the way you thought it would work? Or is it working so well that it's not letting you write anything? And now you need to figure out ways to, to do that. I just, I, I think it, it can be very overwhelming really, really quick for somebody who's new in the industry to try and wrap their head around all of this short of, of joining the Institute of Work Comp Professionals, which I've already said several times, I feel like honestly, every agency should so that they have a level playing field with the people they're competing against. But um, where where do you think a new producer should start, knowing how much change is happening right now? Where would where would be your place to start 
if you were uh, a new producer going out to lead with workers comp in today's environment? I want to talk about that. You said a couple of things that I, I think are important and I, I had a couple of, of comments on them. The first is as you learn about these changes and as you talk to your, your business owner clients about them, um, as with almost every experience mod change that we've seen in the 22 years that we've been doing this, the primary brunt of the impact is going to be uh, the outliers, which is to say that the very best mods are likely to get better and the very worst mods are likely to get worse. Um, but regardless, there's a couple of things agents need to keep in mind as they talk to prospects and clients about this, or even when, when their client comes to them and says, oh man, my mod went up 30 points this year. What's up with that? Um, don't be so fast. First of all, don't be fast to blame the changes, uh, right? It's, it's a very common thing for people to say, oh yeah, you know, the rating bureau is the state is just trying to screw you. Um, in, in most, if not pretty close to all cases uh, in the past where we've seen a mod change and then a mod jumps a lot, uh, it generally has more to do with the information that is coming onto the mod and or the information that fell off. So no matter the change, that mod was going was gonna to take a big jump in that, in that next year. And one of the things that I, I find is really important in what I do, because uh, David, as you know, sometimes agents can be uh, pretty emotional, especially when it comes to advocating for their clients, is that no one's doing this to them, right? This is not some violence that's being perpetrated against your client. This is a an adjustment to the way the system works to make the system overall uh, work more effectively. And chances are, if the change in the mod calculation made your client's experience mod go up, that's because it was too low before. Um, well, that's the whole and, point of making so I, the adjustment I, is to try and make it more accurate, right? Right. And so, so I work really hard to stay dispassionate. People will say, well, why are they doing this? And I can explain the why that NCCI has explained, but I can't like look into the hearts of the actuaries at NCCI and like, you know, and get into some, you know, deeper metaphysical meaning of why they're doing what they're doing. This is what's happening. You know, it's like when they put a roundabout in your town and everybody craps their pants because they don't know how to drive around a roundabout. It's like, well, this, this is how it is. So like you learn how to drive roundabout. So you find a new, a new way to work right? There's no reason to get all worked up. about. Um, and the second thing is the soft market. What you're describing is a bunch of people running after the piles of money that are in workers comp right now, where every other line of commercial insurance is, is losing money hand over fist. Uh, I mean, we're three or four years in a row now of voluntary market comp running a mid 80s uh, combined ratio where if you go back and look historically over the last 20 years, there was, there was only a handful of years where the loss ratio was even scraped below 100%. And it's why rates keep going down because those loss ratios remain ridiculously low. So these companies that, that weren't very enthusiastic about writing comp period maybe, or writing comp in, in particular marketplaces or niches um, now are very enthusiastic about it because it's the only place to get reliable, positive returns in commercial insurance right now. Um, now, if you were a new producer, then the first thing I would say, both to new producers that are listening, but probably more importantly to agency owners that are hiring new producers. Our industry has a long and illustrious history of, uh, of training people. Uh, and I love hearing stories from uh, Preston and other people who got into the industry in the 50s and 60s. You know, I've heard people tell me like they weren't even allowed to touch telephone for a year. Uh, they just shadowed people and, and learned the business. Uh, that went away decades ago. But what insurance agencies still do a lot of times, they spend a tremendous amount of time and energy and in a lot of cases money uh, finding producers that they believe can be successful and then they enroll them in some sort of 
um, I'll, I'll call it broadly company schools. I'm sure there are people out there that aren't insurance companies doing this where you, uh, you know, send people away for, for weeks at a time. And I'm sure there's online versions of this stuff now. And they try and make them a PhD in insurance in, in four or six weeks. And those folks come back with a, a much larger vocabulary, right? They learned about a lot of stuff. I'm not convinced that very many of those people actually learn a whole lot about insurance. And what they, what they probably learn uh, more than anything else is how to be the agency's biggest E&O risk, right? Because, and then the, the agency owner says, go forth and write business. And then they come back you know, 12, 18, 24 months later and say, you know, why hadn't this joker written any business? Now I'm going to have to fire him because he hadn't, hadn't validated and we're going to have to start all over again. Well, what policy is simpler than workers' compensation? There's not a policy you sell with language where every single person you sell it to, the policy reads the same, the coverage terms are the same. You know, we could talk about varying employers' liability limits, but just put a million on everything and be done with it. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're never going to walk into a business and find out they're $5 million un underinsured on their workers' comp right? Somebody falls off a ladder. It doesn't matter what insurance company writes that policy. The benefits that person receives are the same, which is not to suggest that every insurance company services claims as well as others. Uh, but you understand what I mean. It's the, the policy is very, very simple. Um, there's obviously complexity to it. Um, but the policy is very simple. So if I were a new producer or I were an agency owner hiring a new producer, I would get them trained up in workers' comp, and I would say, hey, Sally, our new producer, your job is to go generate leads and write workers' comp, and when you get that broker of record or, or you write a new policy, then you say, you know, let's meet next week. I'm going to bring my colleague David in who can take a look at, you know, your other insurance and make sure that, that that's taken care of appropriately. And how much faster can someone validate if they're only having to focus in one place? Now, the there's multiple challenges with this, but I think they're almost all tied to the way that we believe agencies should work. Uh, many, many insurance agencies appear to the outside world to be a company right? An employer that has employees that are all pulling in the same direction, working to grow the company and ensure the success of the company. But the reality of a great number of insurance agencies uh, is that it's, you know, however many number of producers they have running separate and distinct businesses that all happen to have the same name in the top left corner of their business card. And so you have this lone wolf attitude. Um, and there's, you know, that fits a lot of people's personalities, but it's really challenging as a new person in this business to create success if that's the way that you're doing it. And it obviously can be done. Your, your group is full of people that have, have come into the business that way and been successful. Uh, but we all know the incredibly high failure rate that new producers have in this business. And we're convinced that starting them with workers comp and then you know down the line let them incrementally you know build those other skills so they can be on their own but don't expect them to do it all all at once because you're just setting every everyone involved up for failure yeah i agree and i think you know there's so much out there that's readily available at our fingertips at this point from a knowledge and education standpoint, the one thing that I would challenge all of my peers out there that own agencies to do, and even, even if you don't own an agency and you're a producer, don't, don't just go to the company education because that's the one you get to co-op dollars for. And that's the one you think you can afford. If you're going to invest in yourself, invest in yourself. Um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Obviously we're huge fans of the Institute, big fan of the national alliance to get your cic and your crm you know they made it very easy and very affordable to do that when covid hit 
and I've never, I've just never been one that's been big on the company sponsored training program specifically for sales, because I feel like they're training you to sell for their company and you lack the broad base. I'm not saying you should abandon those completely, but I don't think that's the foundation. I think that is what you sprinkle on top when the foundation's built. So be careful. You know, we all need to invest in ourselves. We all need to make sure that we're taking the time to to get better at what we do, learn our craft better, represent our clients and prospects better. And that that doesn't mean just go to go to the place that's the cheapest or the place that you can afford or the place that sends you the most emails, advertise and really take time and figure out where you want to live in this industry. And then make a plan for your own education around that. It might be that you want to join a program that's going to cost you 10, 15, 20 grand, and you don't have that money today. Well, make a plan around it. Save, save some money every month, you know, put it into a, what we call a sinking fund. And one day you will have enough for it. And then it'll make it all the, all the better, more sweeter because you paid for it. The other thing is there are a lot of opportunities out there to get better at your craft through education that you can get co-op co-op dollars from your carriers. Talk to them about that. You know, I've had people that have gotten money from carriers to join Killing Commercial because the carrier wants them to go through the sales training process so they can end up writing more business with the carrier. Everybody wins in that environment. And then this other thing is check with your state. Check with your state to see if there are grants available for continuing ed or further education. I know that I have I have a grant available, not that the territory is open, but in Massachusetts, where you could go, you could fill out the paperwork, and you can get a grant that basically covers the initiation fee or the enrollment fee into Killing Commercial. That makes a big difference because that is not a small check to write. And if you could get in and all you have to be responsible for is the ongoing, you know, trail to stay in the community, that's a game changer. So if you hear this stuff and your first response is, oh, I don't have money, I can't afford it. My first piece of advice is learn to be more resourceful. Quit making excuses. There's a way to get it done. You just need to figure it out or invent one. And the second thing is take action and take that first step and move forward. Kevin, what did we miss? Anything else you wanted to bring up on this one? I know we're going to do another episode here maybe next week. You know, I mean, I, I agree with everything that you just said there. The one the one word of caution uh, that I would put to folks when they're, uh, when they're using the Google machine to try and find information about workers' comp is if you're looking for an answer, first of all, um, all due respect to the people that have put together websites that list class codes and claim to have <laughs> rates and things of that nature. Um, I would not trust those. Um, and I am certain that at some point when that page was brand new, the information there was likely current. Uh, but class codes change all the time. Uh, and if you're in an independent bureau state, you can you can get that information for free from their website. Uh, NCCI puts their manuals behind a paywall. Although I know um, I'm missing the name of the software now. It used to be called Silver Plume, and it's called something different now. But oh yeah, it um, used to be Sage know, and Silver Plume. I don't remember what they call it now, but I know that like Rough Notes has a lot of that stuff, and they've integrated with Zywave, and they provide a lot of what Sage and Silver Plume used to do when I was first coming up through the ranks. Yeah, so you can find that information, but if you're looking to find out like what what this class code number means, right? The title is largely irrelevant. It's really what's beneath the title that says this is what a company that goes in this class code does and what they don't do and what materials they use and what processes um, you know, the rating bureau manuals or some sort of commercial vendor that licenses that information from the rating bureau. Uh, is a is a great source. And the second thing, when you're and this happens to me, someone will ask a question about you know some kind of esoteric claim situation or something of that nature, um, and you want to I for me, I want to find the same answer in two or three different places when it comes to like interpretation of state laws or case law or how things like that are handled. Um, ironically, plaintiffs' attorneys are often 
the best source of information when it comes to um, to case law and how kind of quirky things in your state might work because they're writing a ton about it, trying to get the SEO to get injured workers to come call them. Um, but just be careful where you get your information from uh, if you're if you're using the internet, uh, both because it could be out of date and uh, and it it might not be accurate or you know exactly be answering the question you're looking to answer. Um, but the the last thing specifically about these experience mod changes, um, David, I'll I'll send you a link after we wrap up, and you can put it in your show notes to this spreadsheet that I was referring to. It has uh, every state that's that's being impacted by these changes. We know the split point uh, for each of those states. We know uh, the date the the change is going to take place. Um, we know whether or not it's been approved and it's been approved in every NCCI state uh, with the exception of Florida, because Florida said, we're just going to approve it when we approve the 2024 20, rate filing, uh, which we expect to be happening uh, any day now. And then when the rate filing is published, I'm updating that with the, uh, the, new, uh, the new claim cap. I actually have the old claim cap and the new claim cap. So you can see that, that contrast. Um, I'll also mention uh, Virginia and Vermont are the two states so far uh, that have um, approved NCCI's filing, but modified it in that they are going to be stepping up to a higher split point instead of jumping all the way. So like Virginia is supposed to be going to 30,000. They're going to go up to 22.5 next year and then up from there the year after and then you know up to 30,000 in the third year. Uh, more similar to what what happened in 2013. Um, but Virginia and Vermont are the only two states that have done that. But that that spreadsheet, uh, I think, might be useful to folks that have listened to this and want to know a little bit more what's happening in in their neck of the woods. Good deal. Well, tell them how to get a hold of you, man. I know that I know it's probably out there on all the other episodes, but this one's fresh and we we continue to grow. So there's probably people who haven't heard the others that'll be going back to listen for sure now. Absolutely. So you can you can learn more about what we do at uh, workcompprofessionals.com. Uh, you can get a hold of me at Kevin at IWCpro.com. That's a little bit easier to type than work comp professionals. Uh, and if you want to set up a time to chat, uh, you can see my calendar by going to schedule with iwcp.com uh, and there's a link there to to book a conversation uh, on my calendar at a time that that works for you and uh, certainly happy to to chat with anyone about a workers comp question they have and uh, and to see if what we do at the institute uh, might be a good fit for the uh, the agency that you're trying to grow Good deal, man. Ladies and gentlemen, he is Kevin Ring with the Institute of Work Comp Professionals. Many of us who know him call him the walking and talking encyclopedia of workers' compensation. I don't know that you can stump him. He said it in a nice way. You know, people give him an esoteric claim scenario, but that's what they're trying to do. People come up with all these crazy things and are trying to stump Kevin. It isn't going to happen. So don't waste your time. But I do encourage you to reach out if you have a question or if you want to take your agency to the next level for sure. The Institute of Work Comp Professionals is able to help you do that. We'll catch you guys next week. See ya. 